Um, yes, yeah, so, so thanks a lot for the invitation and especially for giving both of us a chance to present because it was a joint work. And yeah, so the topic today is microbial network analysis. So how we get hypothesis from um, biological hypothesis from these hairballs. So yeah, I get started and then we'll pass over to Sam. So as you all know, microorganisms interact. Here's uh, an example from the human gut. So there are a large number of cross-feeding relationships and uh, the relatives are much more complex even than this uh, scheme shows. And um, here's another example um, from the ocean. So here we see um, parasites eating their hosts from inside out, but also um, microorganisms living inside other organisms and performing services for them, for them such as a photosynthesis. So there's also endosymbiosis. And um, so all, just, all this to say that if we really want to understand uh, an ecosystem, we need to know um, the interaction. So it's not sufficient to only know the abundances um, we also to really understand what's going on, uh, we need to know um, the microbial interactions. And so the abundances we can relatively easily get um, through sequencing, but it is very hard to observe directly mi microbial interactions. And this is where microbial network inference comes in. So the idea of microbial network inference, of, um, this kind of abundance table, um, presence absence table that, that comes from sequencing data, that we um, infer a network from it. So here, um, the, the taxa are usually um, on the rows. Um, so there's um, the read count or relative abundance. We see here across samples. And um, then we look so at this abundance. We um, take this um, for, for each pair of taxa, uh, taxa we can compute um, a, a similarity score or dissimilarity score, dissimilarity score or correlation between all these um, taxon pairs. And this gives us an edge. So we, um, so I will not go into the details of network construction today. It's not the topic, but uh, just to say that we compute all these um, pairwise similarities or correlations or dissimilarities uh, to get edges, and we uh, assess um, the significance of that. And so what the microbial network then represents, so as a, as a so as a taxa as, as nodes, but we can also have environmental metadata on the nodes, such as pH or temperature. And the edge is a significant association. And I'm carefully avoiding the word interaction here, and I come back to that in a moment. And there are many different tools that perform this operation, so that are doing network inference. And yeah, that, that's it in a nutshell. So there could be many more said about the algorithms and um, so on, but um, yeah, focus today is different. But I will still um, go a bit into the challenges of microbial network inference, because even if you know about network inference, microbial network inference faces some challenges that are specific uh, to sequencing data. So for instance, if you have these sequencing data here represented as, as buckets full of beads and the different colors represent different taxa, you see that uh, across different samples to so different buckets, um, a, a variable number of, 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 of total counts, of total number of beads. And if you do not correct for this and you compute an association, then yeah, you can see that um, that you will um, infer a, a 40 association. If you see here the the red and the blue taxon, so um, their, their counts vary together with the total count. So because uh, the total count varies, so the individual taxon count varies. So, uh, so if you do not take out um, steps, you will infer a spurious association. So whatever you do, you have to treat um, this difference in sequencing depths. And basically it's also comes stemming from technical variation. It's not representing your true cell count in the sample. And since you have to um, take out sequencing depths as a variable, you end up with a constrained total count in your sample. So whatever you do, whatever technique you use, uh, if you rarify to a certain number of reads, let's say 10,000, or if you have relative abundances, you always have the same sum for each sample. So that's, that's, that's a rule in taking out um, variable sequencing depths, but this then leads to compositionality. So to, con to a constraint on the total count of reads per sample. So for instance, um, to illustrate this, here are three taxa a gray, a red, and a blue one. And the gray, uh, red and gray taxon, they stay constant. And the blue taxon increases in abundance. This is um, indicated here with the size of the bead. So that we also see happening when we look at relative abundances. So, so the, when the sample um, count is um, the same across samples, the total count. And um, so that uh, so the, the blue taxon increases, but the red and gray, um, they decrease in abundance in the relative abundances although they don't when we look at the, at the count data. So why is this? It's because of the constraint. So if we um, constrain the, the, the total sample counts, which we have to do because of varying sequencing depths, then we run into this issue of compositionality 
where we introduce spurious associations just because of the fact that we have transformed this data. So here we have an, a positive association between the red and gray taxon that's not there in the real data, and um, a negative one of the red and gray to the blue one. And this is, in a nutshell, the issue of compositionality that network inference tools have to deal with. So what do the network inference tools do to deal with this? Um, so they normally rely on the ratio trick. So if we divide a taxon count by the total count and another taxon count by the total count, and then we divide uh, these two ratios, um, we basically get rid of the total count. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, the idea of, of these various um, ratio transformations here, the center log ratio transformation, for instance. And there are also um, association measures that are specifically designed for compositional data, such, such as the Eichensen distance or the Bray-Curtis dissimilarity. So that's one way of dealing with this issue. Um, from the bioinformatics side, you can also deal with it um, from the experimental side by actually taking your sample, diluting it, and actually counting the cells in your sample with a device, uh, with a flow cytometer. Um, yes, in both cases, you run into problems. It's really a, a fundamental problem that's not easily solved. If you do this um, log ratio trick, um, you run into um, the zero ratio. Because if you divide by zero, you end up with an infinity. And um, yeah, just ignoring zeros, as I will discuss in a moment, is not a solution. Um, for, yes, you can get the total cells experimentally, but it's a question whether you also should use the total count. Um, it is a fundamental question in ecology, whether you should work with composition or with the absolute counts, because if the absolute count does not result from your interaction, it's also a, a confounding factor that you have to take out. So it depends uh, on your research question. So I already mentioned um, uh, the challenge of, of, of the attacks specific and to sequencing data. So our sequencing, so our count table that comes out of the sequencing, um, so that will have many zeros in it. So many um, microorganisms that have not been found uh, in, in various samples. And then the problem with this is that uh, a zero in sequencing data is ambiguous. So it may mean that the taxon is truly absent or that the taxon was present but below detection limit, that is below the detection level. And um, if we just ignore that problem, if we just uh, go ahead with the zeros, we just keep them, then we run again into spurious edges. So here we see, for instance, the, 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 the blue and the red taxon, both present in one sample and co-absent across many other samples. If we infer an association network here, we will get a really highly significant association, a very significant correlation, for instance. But in reality, these two taxa may vary randomly below detection limit. So we have to treat these cases. And uh, there are several tools that actually just treat these co-absences as missing values. And that's, that's not a good way because we lose, we lose information. We know that these taxa are, are low in abundance or even absent, and that's information that's valuable. So just treating that as missing value is not ideal. What the, the different network inference tools actually do is to, um, is to use prevalence filters. So they say, um, okay, we keep taxa that are present in at least 50% of the samples, for instance, and the rest of the, of the taxa, they are um, thrown out, or, but the accounts are kept in a, in, a, in a garbage taxon. Yes, and then the question is, how should you choose a prevalence filter? And I cannot tell you, there is, um, there's, a, let's, uh, there's this trade-off between information loss and between spurious associations, but um, there is um, no, no real rule. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of, um, so it's um, chosen arbitrarily. Um, there's at least now an upper bound on, on, um, on the number of zeros um, above which it makes no sense anymore to, to, to perform a statistical test that was um, proposed recently by Kugel and co-workers, but that's it. So that problem is, is, is not yet solved and you have it in microbial network inference. Okay, then um, a problem with microbial network inference, that's a, a more generic problem with network inference in general, so um, are indirect edges. So, it's um, edges that are introduced because two taxa respond to a third taxon or an environmental factor. And this, of course, is a, a one reason why correlation is not causation. I still put an example here. So you have two taxa that respond uh, positively to an increasing environmental factor, for instance, phosphate. And when you compute um, the, the edges, you will get an indirect edge between the two taxa, although they are not interacting with each other. So, there is a, so there are several tools that have been developed that get rid of these indirect um, taxon-induced edges um, by um, basically computing the inverse covariance matrix. 
So the covariance matrix, so this is a nice example here to, to visually show, um, I won't, won't go into details, but just to visually show what the idea, what this idea. So covariance matrix is a correlation divided, um, not divided by standard deviation. And um, so you see here that uh, it really has all the indirect edges. So this is an example, the toy example, you have um, springs connecting weights and the, the weight here will also affect uh, the weight here in this um, matrix. But if you um, compute the inverse covariance matrix, you get rid of these indirect edges and you only um, keep the direct edges. And um, the assumptions are that, um, so that's conditional independence, so I forgot to say. So the assumptions for this operation uh, for computing the inverse covariance, ma covariance matrix are that the data are multivariate uh, normally distributed. And this is a very important one that all the taxa, that all the items that play a role in the system are actually part of the matrix. And there are a number of network inference tools uh, that implement this principle, such as SpeakEasy, Gcoder, and, and, and FlashWeave. And then there are also environmentally induced, uh, then there are also uh, indirect edges that are induced by the environment. And these are not part of the matrix, usually. So we are not always sure that we have measured all the environmental factors that play a role. So there are different ways to deal with this. Um, one way, if you have measured environmental factors, is include, in the, include them in the network construction. Because um, you can see from the edge pattern here that it's already giving a hint whether uh, taxon edges are environmentally induced, induced or not. Here, for instance, we have um, taxa responding negatively to pH or responding positively to pH to different groups of taxa, and uh, these negative edges and are likely indirect. Then, of course, if your um, samples come from uh, different environments, so for instance, if you have um, different water depths um, uh, and the environment changes uh, at each uh, uh, depth, then of course it makes sense to, to, to stratify these samples um, by, by, by depth so that you um, do not compute edges that just come from, from the environment that changes. You already know that it's not what you're interested in. So then you, you construct a network uh, by water layer, for instance, or here for different um, um, pH values. Um, yeah, there's also this approach of regressing out environmental um, factors um, and then computing the taxon network uh, in the residuals. The problem with this approach is that it often assumes um, a linear response to, to the environmental factors. And as we know from basic biology that um, taxa are not always responding linear. Normally they have an optimum and then they go less well uh, 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 and both directions are away from the optimum. So, and uh, dealing with these nonlinear responses and, and this kind of regression approaches is, is, is quite difficult. And finally, there are also uh, various ways um, to filter the network after construction. Okay, so now I have um, mentioned a couple of problems with microbial network and um, construction. So the question is then, so there are so many tools available also to, to construct these networks. So the question is, um, how well do they perform? Which one uh, should you choose if, 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 you, if you want to um, uh, compute a microbial network from your sequencing data? And um, so the, the trouble is that we have no good benchmark data. So there's no ecosystem for which we have fully resolved the interaction network in, in situ. We have that we have fully resolved interaction networks in vitro, but not but not for for, 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 for ecosystems out there. So for not in situ. So we are really forced to use um, data generation methods um, to to generate um, realistic community sizes. And um, so we, we rely on simulations to, to generate data with which to evaluate uh, network inference tools. And these simulations, um, yes, um, they reflect uh, what we think is a, as an underlying generating process, but um, we may be wrong. They may not capture the, the true generating process. So I will now um, present one of the main ways in which microbial abundance data can be generated. And um, for this, I'm introducing um, a population model that's really widely used. It's a generalized Dotka Volterra. So how does it how does this population model look like? So it says that the change of species abundances can be modeled as a function of, of the growth rates of the species and their interactions, their pairwise interactions. So growth rates and pairwise interactions are the main are the two parameters of, 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 of this population model. And um, so this interaction matrix is, um, is depicted here. So here's an example. And you can see it's asymmetric. So this comma-shaped bacterium has a positive um, effect on the star-shaped bacterium. 
um, but not vice versa. And this is an equivalent to a directed uh, network where we have um, yeah, this commensalist interaction in that way, but it's not mutualistic because there's no arrow going back. So this equation basically gives us a set of rules that we can then use to simulate community dynamics. So here's an example. So we have an interaction matrix um, for 10 species so that we have just generated randomly, uh, not fully randomly, but according to some rules. So we know how the uh, interaction looks like here. Here we know the interactions, that's the point. Um, we have, we know the growth rates, uh, we select some initial abundances and then up, we apply iteratively this rule in, in form of this differential equation. And we go from our initial abundances, we update them, we update them, we update them until we reach um, here a steady state. And in this way, we can generate um, a microbial composition for a given interaction matrix. And for an evaluation, it's always also important that we add noise. So we can do this during the simulation, or we can add noise afterwards um, to reflect a measurement error or, or small perturbations. And yeah, of note, um, the generous Dr. Paul Voltara is, 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 of course, only one among many um, population models, but um, it is one of the simplest and uh, most widely used. OK, so then I come the first evaluation that I wanted to mention. Um, so this was um, in, in 2016 with the first wave of, of, of microbial net inference tools, also including um, just um, correlation measures. And it was not, 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 a dream style not a dream evaluation, but dream style in the sense that it was evaluators who, who, who ranked the tools, so who benchmarked the performance of the tools. Um, so they gave data sets to the tool developers and the tool developers sent back the results to, to the evaluators. So yeah, it was at least separated. So um, then in this evaluation, at first uh, the, the, the evaluators checked um, the false positive rate by generating data that did not contain any interactions. So they were just sampled from a, from, from, from a random distribution. Uh, or, or from, from, yeah. And um, so in this interaction-free data, every edge is a false positive. And we can see that those tools differ very widely in their false positive rate. Here is a quite large false positive rate uh, for Spark. Anyways, an old early tool is no longer that might widely used. Uh, we also see um, that the tools are quite um, different uh, in terms of robustness. To assess that, the evaluators, um, so they had a 16S data set, so a sequencing data set, and they um, basically re it, so they introduced small noise. And the tool was then run on all the 10 data sets, so basically the same data set with small noise. And the expectation is that the network that comes out of it is 10 times the same. And as you can see here, it's not, it's, it's only for, for two tools that it is really, that the edges are really preserved across all the reruns. And, 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 and several other tools are really sensitive uh, to that small noise. So they will give you a different network when you add small noise. So that's uh, not the desired property of, of, of a network construction tool, of course. Um, then I mentioned compositionality as an issue, and um, we see here the performance uh, of the tools um, when we um, increase uh, this compositional effect. So this was done by just making the community more and more uneven. So it's um, a species pair that gets more and more abundant, and uh, the other um, species are uh, less and less abundant. So it's highly uneven. The effective species number goes down, and we see that indeed um, some measures are really robust to that and other tools um, such as GoNet are really affected. And uh, it is also a function of the evenness. Um, yes, and uh, different normalization techniques did not, did not help. Then to the actual um, accuracy when it comes to, 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 to um, the inference of interactions. So this is what uh, we hope we can use those tools for. So here um, for this first wave evaluation, we see that um, the two performance is, is really bad. So I've uh, put the ideal tool here as a silver bullet um, at, at the upper corner where it should go, um, when the tools would be perfect. And yeah, the tools are the other, on the other side. So yeah, so basically in, in this evaluation, the tools were not able to, to correctly infer directions. Um, so we have seen that uh, also in other evaluations um, that the tools are really far from, from a good performance in terms of network infer inference. Here's a recent one um, from 2000 again, <laughs> far away from the silver bullet. And here this was um, an evaluation that Sam carried out because he wanted to know if the approval improves accuracy, improves accuracy of the tools. And indeed it does. Here we have at least a high precision, which is good news already. But Sam also took into account uh, underlying environmental factors 
effects that are not taken out when we um, compute the inverse covariance matrix. And the stronger they are, the more, um, the stronger their effect, um, the less precise are the tools. So really shows that there's a limit to what um, inverse covariance matrix, the inverse covariance, covariance matrix can do. So we really need to know <laughs> um, the environmental factors that also influence um, taxon abundances. And again, um, the silver bullet would be here. We are um, either have high precision, high sensitivity, it's a trade-off that we know well, and um, we are still far from the silver bullet. Okay, so you might think this is a very bad performance uh, that microbial network inference, um, yeah, that um, you cannot do much with it, but there are um, a few very successful um, uh, application examples that I will briefly um, introduce. So we applied a microbial network inference um, to um, an ocean data set, and we saw one um, edge that, that was particularly um, high scoring and that the two um, um, species were also highly abundant in one sample. And then our collaboration partners actually looked at that sample and they could see that indeed there was a microalgae inside a platform. So we really could predict a new interaction with microbial association networks as, as bad as they are, because this was maybe also a, a, a low hanging fruit because an organism inside another organism is, is the simplest, yeah, is, is, is an easy, easily detected interaction. And this other example is on mice. So they were exposed to a pathogen Clostridium difficile, and um, and, uh, and then treated with, with anti so at first treated with antibiotics and exposed to the pathogen, and um, this time series data was then used uh, to infer an interaction network, so network inference, and they saw that there were a few Clostridia that interacted negatively with the pathogen, and when they gave those Clostridia to the mice, then the mice could survive for longer, so they would die with the Clostridium when they were not treated. And when they were treated with this consortium that was inferred from the network inference, um, they survived for longer. So it's also uh, a successful um, application example. So in some cases, network inference um, can predict interactions. Okay, but yeah, I repeat, we have this challenge of, um, of biological validation. And so we do not have a fully resolved interaction network in C2. We do have um, species, uh, so, so um, we do have lists where we have um, species interactions. And we can match against these species, species interactions and see um, if we find them back in the network. And then this way we can assess sensitivity. But we do not know whether two species really do not interact in Z2. And so we do not have um, two negatives. And so we cannot, um, so we are not sure if, if a false positive really is false. And um, so we cannot uh, compute accuracy. So in vitro, we can get all the pairwise interactions, uh, also two negatives, two uh, false positives. We can, we can, we, we, we can really get all, 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 all the matrix that we need uh, to compute accuracy. But then we are also not sure whether the interactions that we see in vitro also take place in Z2. And also, we, uh, um, this only works if there are no higher order interactions, but there are only a few cases. Um, yeah, so these are the challenges of, of, of biological validation of microbial network inference. So there were a few cases um, of biological validation. It's still um, only a few. As I said, we still like data sets and uh, results were rather mixed. I think in the interest of time, I will not uh, go too much into it. Um, but yeah, there were positive as well as negative examples. But as I said, uh, we need more uh, validation data to really assess um, the true performance better. I just wanted to quickly say before I pass over to Sam, that there are also other applications of microbial networks than just interaction prediction, at which they are always bad in evaluations. What the microbial networks are good at, I think, is um, the influence of, of niche structure. So here's an example um, from an early data set, the Human Microbiome Project, um, so for, for dental plug um, bacteria. So we built a network for that. Um, and um, so then later on, we were lucky. Um, so somebody looked at the um, dental plug composition. So they had a very nice um, way to, to uh, with fluorescence to, to look at um, how bacteria were forming biofilms and were structured. And we saw that indeed in the early stages and at the outer layer of this biofilm, we see um, taxa that are actually anti, uh, um, here having the same negative associations with, with taxa that are more in the, in the in the inner ring here. So we could um, reproduce that structure. Here we also see that the Christian Capuncitophaga that are here in the inner ring that are also associated. So we really see um, the structure that's driven basically by oxygen also in the network. And the other application uh, that 
that you can do with a microbial network is to, for instance, is to link a taxa to, to function. So, um, so our colleagues, for instance, they took the Tara Oceans and microbial network. So they clustered it with a tool um, called WGCNA. And they then screened representatives of the clusters um, for the association to a variable of interest here, carbon export. And that's much better. Um, multiple testing correction is a problem. So it's, it's much less of an issue. If you look at cluster representatives, a dozen, dozen cluster representatives instead of thousands and thousands of, of species. And they then identified uh, uh, one taxon that was especially tightly linked uh, to carbon export. Um, yes, yeah, so now I've talked a lot about uh, microbial network inference and the challenges and um, how it performed in evaluations and uh, what we can do with it. But um, so what the tools give you is, is a hairball. And if you want to learn something from that hairball, you need some tools. And this was basically um, Sam's PhD project. And so I'm now um, giving the word to him to, to um, discuss the tools that, um, to present the tools that he developed to analyze microbial networks. All right. Let me see if I can share my screen. There we go. So thank you, Caroline, for the introduction. So as Caroline mentioned, I'll present the tools that I developed during my PhD. Um, I'll present three of them. Firstly, Manta, the clustering algorithm that's also listed on the screen now. Then I'll talk about the Neuron, the toolbox for comparing multiple networks. And finally, I'll discuss Mako, which is a toolbox for working with graph databases. Um, but yeah, first let me start with, so with something that you might have seen in the previous slides already, a hairball. So as Caroline mentioned, we often get the hairballs. And part of this is due to the poor accuracy of network inference. So we have many of these associations and we don't know exactly which ones are correct. But as I showed during earlier simulations, um, when we have increasing environmental strength, then the hairball tends to start showing some kind of structure. So it's also what you can see here. As the environmental strength increases, the hairball starts splitting into two clusters. And you can't really see this on the image, but each of the two clusters in the network on the right, they're actually all connected by positively weighted edges. So this suggests that this difference between these positive and negatively weighted associations are able to give uh, some indication of the community structure. So this is exactly what I tried to figure out with the Manta clustering algorithm. Yeah. So this is an example of a toy network with positive and negatively weighted associations. And you can see one ideal cluster on the left, these are colored in green, and then the other one in purple on the right. But unfortunately, many clustering algorithms, they aren't able to use this information of positive and negative weights. The Manta algorithm was basically intended to solve this by using the principle, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So in this particular example, you can see that node four isn't actually connected to six and seven in the purple cluster, but because it's not positively related to the rest of the network, uh, it's still assigned to the same cluster. So how does this algorithm work exactly? Well, we start with uh, a graph like the examples you see, as you see above a little network, and then we initialize a scoring matrix. And you can see that scoring matrix uh, uh, in D1 here, and this is actually then the adjacency matrix. So what does that mean? Well, in this undirected adjacency matrix, each position in the matrix corresponds to position in the network. So here, a red position means that there was no association, a white position means that there was a positive association, and a black means that there was a negative association. And what the Manta algorithm does is it takes the power of the matrix. And this is actually something that random walk-based algorithms also do. So this is like walking across the network. But most random walk-based algorithms, like the Markov clustering algorithm, they then normalize, so you only get non-negative values. And what the Manta algorithm does, it is a different normalization step, which preserves the negative weights. So as you can see, through the iterations of the Manta algorithm, the black positions, they move, but they are still preserved in the network. This means that we eventually get a scoring matrix with a range of minus one uh, to one. However, it does often enter flip-flop state, and that's what you can see also as the title in figure D. And what this means is that it starts alternating between two alternative states. In this case, you can see five and six are quite similar to seven and eight, respectively. Now, what uh, the algorithm then actually does, 
Well, very rarely we may actually reach convergence like you see here, and then we have only positive and uh, strongly negative values. But normally we take iterations of, of subsets of the, of the network and these we then combine to generate a combined scoring matrix. Then we can cluster on the columns and this gives us then the clustering assignment. And additionally, to try and tackle this noisiness of network inference, the mental algorithm is also able to rewire the original network and generate alternative clustering assignments. And this gives an idea of how robust the um, clustering assignment actually is to errors in the network inference process. So in this case, we can get both the cluster-wise robustness and we can get the node-wise robustness. Additionally, we're able to find out uh, using specific special positions in the scoring matrix uh, whether uh, some of these nodes in these clusters cannot actually confidently be assigned to any cluster. And you'll see how that works in practice in a moment. So, of course, I wanted to actually compare this algorithm uh, to other algorithms, but unfortunately, there's no real microbiome data with ground truth clusters in known interaction networks. So what I had to do is I had to simulate clusters to evaluate the performance. And I did this using two different strategies. One is to use a population model based on generalized Lotka Volterra, which is also what Caroline explained a few minutes ago. And the other was to use the Fabia biclustering algorithm, which was designed uh, for use on gene expression data. I evaluated multiple clustering algorithms, so the Manta algorithm, WGCNA, Louvain clustering, Markov clustering, Gervin Newman clustering, and Kerning and Lin uh, bi uh, bipartition algorithm. And for some of these algorithms, I also gave the option to run on the full network or only the positively weighted associations. And I did this because it's actually um, advice that we quite commonly gave to people wanting to use these clustering algorithms if they don't work well on the complete network because they cannot use the uh, negative weights in the network, well, then just run it on only the positive network. So basically, this is what the results of the evaluation looks like. So I was able to get to compute the sensitivity, the positive predictive value or the precision, the accuracy, the cluster separation, which is a measure of cluster quality. And I also uh, developed a different metric, the sparsity, which is able to take these edge weights into account because it basically computes the ratio of edge weights that are inside clusters and those uh, outside clusters. So it assumes that a good clustering assignment is one where within the cluster we only have positive associations and between clusters we have negative associations. So these are what the results look like when we use our data generated with generalized Lotka Volterra. On the right, we see the number of nodes, uh, the number of networks that could actually be confidently assigned. And uh, then you see actually these violin plots that show the distribution of all these scores I mentioned. And what I found really interesting is that many of these algorithms, they have not been adapted to work specifically with weighted networks. They only work well on the networks of positive associations. So you can see that Louvain clustering, it didn't return suitable results when we gave it the complete network. And similarly with the Gerfer Newman clustering. However, I also found that many of the other algorithms that I evaluated, such as WGCNA, a Markov clustering, and the Kernig and Lin bipartition algorithm, they all work well as long as the settings are set appropriately. Specifically for Markov clustering, it tends to work quite well, but you need to set the, well, some of the parameters correctly. Um, and moreover, Manta, regardless of the settings we used, was able to always perform decently and on par with the other clustering algorithms. On the Fabia evaluation specifically, we can also see that the weak clustering assignment improved the separation of these uh, clusters a little bit. So this shows that um, generally we are able to get good performance, but by including or excluding the weakly assigned nodes, we can slightly affect it. So what do these clusters look like when we look at real data? So here at the right, you're looking at a network of ocean microbiome data. And we cluster this with the Manta clustering algorithm. You can see that we have cluster zero, the circles, and we have cluster one, the triangles. And additionally, we have nodes between them that have a pink border. This means that they were assigned a weak assignment. They couldn't confidently be assigned to any cluster. And as you can see, they're on the periphery of the, 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 the nodes that are really orienting towards the left or the right. Now, if I sum the abundances of these taxa belonging to these clusters and I overlay it on the principal coordinate ordina uh, component ordination that you can see in B, we can see that these abundances correlate very strongly to environmental factors. So, for example, cluster zero abundance correlates strongly together with the air temperature. 
and cluster one correlates strongly with the chlorophyll concentration. This suggests that these are really seasonally driven clusters um, because you know this ocean microbiome data that we were working with was collected throughout almost an entire year. But what's especially interesting to note is that when we look at the weekly assigned nodes, this is actually perfectly anti-correlated to the silicate concentration. And this is something that increased significantly during a storm that took place during the experiment. So this suggests that these nodes that were assigned to a weak cluster, they were pretty much always present in the data set, but they started decreasing in abundance when uh, the storm started happening. So with this, I'd like to wrap up the clustering algorithm and move on to the second tool I developed, which is uh, a neuron, a non-model based uh, toolbox for network comparison. So as I in, uh, introduced in the beginning, we often have hairballs uh, that are quite inaccurate. And one solution is to try to get them to be more precise. But another solution is to try and compare them. If we have a lot of relatively inaccurate data, maybe we can combine it to get a more accurate result, or at least a more informative result. And one way to do that is to compare the overlap between networks. So for example, we might have time series from multiple people from their stool samples, and then we might be able to make a time series network for each of these people. So then we have one network for each participant, and then we might compare it to see if there's some core networks, some associations that are perhaps so important that we can always detect them. But actually doing this comparison is not so straightforward because um, there's actually quite a large chance that networks are similar, more similar than you might expect, just because there's a shared core microbiome. Networks are already generated from microbiome data. And if this microbiome data is from similar microbiomes, then probably there will be a core microbiome, which means we're not sampling from all the possible microbes that exist, but only from a limited selection. So it's difficult to know if our network overlap or similarity or differences is larger or smaller than we would expect uh, from a completely random network. And the solution to this is to compare the networks that we have and observe to networks that we generate using non-models. And these non-models, they then represent the assumption that we can get a certain network comparison value by getting completely random networks from our data. So this is what the Inurin Toolbox does basically. It imports multiple networks, then constructs null models, and then returns the sizes of sets. And what is a set exactly? Well, a set is simply a collection of edges, or in our case, usually associations. And an intersection set, is uh, these are all the edges that are shared by groups. So for example, if we have an intersection of three networks, then we are talking about all the associations or edges that were shared by three networks. A difference is the collection of edges that are not shared by groups. So we might look, for example, at edges that are unique to two or three networks. And we can also do sets of sets. So we can have a difference of intersections. And in that way, we can get edges that are shared by three networks, but not shared by four networks. And we can interpret this quite similarly to how we would look at a core microbiome or a core network, where we can get these sets representing 40, 60, or 80% of the community. These are then the null models that are actually used by the Neuron Toolbox. You see on the top that we have a random null model. So here, all the edges are removed and the entire network is completely rewired. So this null model assumes that the structure is uh, not conserved. On the bottom, we have the degree preserving null model. So here we take specific edges and then we swap them. And this actually preserves the connectivity and the structure of the network. So now we can see if we have similarity uh, between our networks, is this simply due to the structure of those networks or due to the biological identity of the taxa that are participating in that network? So, this is the data that I tested here in our own toolbox on. So this is actually um, an image from the sponge microbiome project, which is a huge data set from all over the world um, where they collected over 3000 samples belonging to 268 uh, sponge host species. And since I didn't want to do a network for each of these sponge host species, I grouped them by the sponge host order. And then I tried to assess how similar these sponge microbial networks were. And you can see the result of that here. So it's a bit of a confusing figure, so I'll walk you through it step by step. We have first the observed data. This is the, the black line. Um, then we also have the number of edges that are shared by a certain group. This is the set size. So this is on the y-axis. 
On the x-axis, we have the difference of the intersections. So six uh, up to seven means associations or edges that were shared by six sponge host orders, but not by seven. And then the different colors represent the normals. So we have in red, we have a normal which represents 50% of the total network size. And in green, we have a positive, uh, sorry, positive control model, which represents 10% of the network size. And then in blue, we have the negative control models. And these basically represent a situation where no uh, edges are really conserved at all. So what you can see is that clearly our observed sponge core, the black line is much lower than our positive control 50%. But it's also higher than the blue lines, particularly at the point uh, 5 to 6, 6 to 7, you can see it's quite a bit higher. This means that even though we don't have a huge sponge core network, it is there and it's larger than the random network. If we actually look at this network here, you can see all the edges that were uh, present in at least three host orders. We can also see some biological reasons why uh, we might find this uh, sponge core network. So again, I had separated the network in clusters, and what's of particular interest is that cluster zero, the diamonds, they appear to have more taxa that are associated to HMA. And what does HMA mean? Well, sponges can have high microbial abundance, HMA, or low microbial abundance, which is the LMA. So what it looks like is that these core associations are representing this dichotomy between high microbial abundance and low microbial abundance sponges. And actually, we were able to find out in literature that this is not a phylogenetically conserved relationship. So if we have a sponge host order, then not all sponges, sponge species belonging to that order, are necessarily high microbial abundance. And it looks like the different associations that are caused by these differences in high microbial and low microbial abundance, that these are preserved across some of these sponge or host orders. Now, the other tool I want to present today is MACO, which is a tool for working with graph databases. And just like the uh, tool I previously introduced, uh, this is a tool which is intended for the comparison of multiple networks. So one of the problems I ran into when I started working with multiple networks is that um, you usually need improved infrastructure to manage your data. So popular libraries like Network X and iGraph, they're great if you're working with one network or maybe five networks. But when you start getting to a point where you have so many networks that you're running into memory issues, you need to read your network data from a database. Now, one way to do this would be to design a static network database where someone generates a network and they upload that network and then you can download their specific network. But this is not ideal because the structure of our association networks depends on the user needs or the research question. Say, for example, that we have seasonal data from multiple areas in the world. Maybe you want to have a network that captures the change in the community across seasons. So then you use all the data from the entire year for the different locations. Or maybe you want to compare the community only in winter across different locations. So now you only subset the samples uh, in winter, but you group them for all the locations. And in this way, the associations that you infer will change drastically. This means that it will be more useful to create a database that is optimized towards the research question that you want to answer. And a over j databases are a really cool way to do this, as I'll hopefully be able to demonstrate. So what is a Neo4j uh, graph database exactly? Well, basically it looks something like this. We have nodes and we have relationships. So you know this is already a network, just like the networks we looked at before. But these, net, uh, these nodes and relationships, they co can contain any kind of information. So in this case, node one is a person with the name of Justin, age 27. And Justin knows Aaron, which is another node in the network. Aaron wrote an article, which is a third node in the network. Um, and just like that, we can have uh, a graph database structure for microbiome data. So what I did with the Mako toolbox, I designed a schema, which basically uh, gives instructions for how the data should be stored. And this schema uses standardized uh, terminology from the National Cancer Institute, Thesaurus. So what the schema is saying, well, we have a taxon, and a taxon is a member of a taxonomic group. It can have a quality, a property just like a sample, a sample can also have a property. A sample is part of an experiment. And additionally, a taxon can participate in an, in an edge, which is part of a network. And by using the standardized schema, we can also design standardized queries. This makes it possible to write queries to very rapidly populate an A over J database, even if you're not familiar with how these databases work. 
So this is an example how you access such a database. We do that using the Cypher query language. Cypher is a pattern-based language. And because it's pattern-based, it actually reflects the structure of knowledge. And you can see that in the example query below. We might be interested in finding the taxonomic families that have associations with a specific taxonomic family of interest, like the Rhodobacteraceae. Then we can write a query like this. It says match family with the name Rhodobacteraceae that is, was assigned to a taxon, which participated in an edge with another taxon, which was also part of another family. And then we return the families. So this is a relatively straightforward day, uh, way to generate all this data. And because we're working with a graph database, which is a local approach, it just basically starts searching the entire database and doesn't do very large table join operations. This means that it tends to be faster than relational databases when you start to work with large numbers of linked data. This is another example, slightly more complicated. Again, we have a family uh, which was assigned to a taxon, but what we're now interested in is actually finding only uh, microbial families that were detected in multiple networks. So in the query, it works like this. We match the family linked to taxon, which was taking part in an edge, found in a network, and then we actually count the number of networks, and we only return families where more than two network links were detected. So of course it's nice to show all these theoretical examples of queries, but of course I'm guessing that as microbiologists you might want to know what you can do with it. So here I'm presenting a real, uh, more real world applied example. And you can see in the bottom left actually a very small um, interaction schema that was uh, designed on the publication about the um, production of propionate. So this schema basically shows the different ways that propionate can be produced via 1,2 propane diol. And the colors of the arrows, they actually indicate different um, bacterial genera. So you can see on the right, we have Escherichia, which is colored in yellow. And Escherichia is actually able to produce 1,2 propane diol from fucose or rhamnos. So what I did is I took this very small literature network and I took the 60 networks that I constructed from cheetah data. And then I simply counted the number of edges that could theoretically, oh, that could theoretically carry out this propionate production pathway. And you can see the result on the right. So this is the number of associations that were found between two, tux, uh, between two genera that could theoretically carry out this metabolic pathway. So as you can see here, we actually found the most associations between lactobacillus and bacteroides. This is just a very small example, but if we start getting more literature validated interactions uh, and we are able to upload this to our graph databases, then we will be able to better interpret our association networks uh, much more easily. So I have another example here, which is not related to literature validation, but to network structure specifically. Um, so what you're looking here at the, the x-axis of the figure are uh, network motifs, and specifically these are cliques. And a clique is a network motif where every node in the clique is connected to every other node in the clique. And I wanted to see if we could find specific cliques with specific combinations of edge weights. So what I did, again, I used the 60 networks that I inferred from Cheetah, and I looked if we could find differences in the clique abundance across animal, plant, non-saline, and saline microbiomes. As you can see in the figure here, we did actually find differences. We found that the animal microbiome has many more of these four-node cliques than all of the other microbiomes. What's also interesting is that we could see that specific cliques are completely absent or underrepresented in the database. So this suggests that specific patterns of associations are more common. So again, this is just an example of what you can do with these graph databases, because unlike relational databases, we don't need huge table joints to do these type of, of queries to count motifs. So it's very suitable for microbiome data. And I'm hoping that as we start working with larger data sets, with more networks, that um, these tools will be helpful in the analysis and the comparison of all these networks. With this, I'd like to conclude the presentation about my tools and give the word back to Caroline, who will talk about some other interesting analysis that we can do with networks. Thank you. Okay, so I just wanted to add some words about network properties because they're sometimes computed and they are questionable. So um, I know they're popular, but I think we need uh, to clarify a bit um, why we do not, um, why we did not um, about network properties uh, today. So first, um, so the network properties is maybe the most popular is um, is as uh, a keystone, the concept of a keystone species. So in the original definition by the ecologist um, Payne, it reads like this. So these individual populations are the keystone of the community structure 
and the integrity of the community and its unaltered persistence through time that stability are determined by the activities and abundances. So the idea is that if you remove the keystone from the community, the community strongly changes, more strongly than if you remove any other species. And now there is this um, idea that you can actually identify keystone species in this microbial association networks um, by looking at uh, the topology of these networks. For instance, you can say, okay, you have um, a hub taxon, so a taxon with many neighboring nodes with a high degree, and it could be a keystone candidate or a connecting taxon that connects uh, lots of other taxons so it has a high bit weakness, and it might also be a, a keystone candidate. And this is, um, we see that sometimes in publications. And there are two questions linked to this. So the first question is, so network inference, as I've uh, said in the beginning, has uh, quite a low accuracy, so can identify correctly hub nodes and uh, connector taxa. And um, the second question, even if the tools can correctly identify them, just because the species is highly connected, does it mean it is a keystone species? So I'm going to talk a bit about that. And first about the first question. So can we identify correctly um, hub taxa and connector taxa? So that was uh, another evaluation uh, that Sam also did, I did a lot. And um, so here again, we rely on Lotka Volterra where we can specify um, the interaction matrix and we can really say, we can really determine which taxon is a, is a, is a, is a hub or is a connector taxon. Uh, we, can, we can make the matrix that way. And we feed that, so we generate an um, abundance uh, data with, uh, by, by simulation with a lot of Volterra and we feed um, the resulting data to the different network inference tools. And then we check how often they find back our predetermined um, hub and connector taxa. And when we look at the results, um, so whether the tools actually find back these um, special taxa, um, they do quite a bad job. So maybe CONET has a little bit, sometimes enriches a bit significantly, we could say, go for, for hub taxa, but overall, the tools really do a bad job in just identifying the correct hub and connector taxa. Okay, this was an evaluation with synthetic data. Now there's reality. So I also <laughs> wanted to present a successful case of keystone identification because evaluation on synthetic data is, well, <laughs> is also there's also questions on that. So um, to show that things are not as easy as we sometimes think. Anyways, so this was a very nice study on um, an Arabidopsis thaliana leaf microbiome. And um, so, um, so they inferred a network with a, from, from the microbiome data and they had a hub node, and this was a known pathogen, a species, and they remove it and uh, they compare the network with and without, um, and they compare the community composition with and without um, that um, pathogen, and they see a, a big difference. So they experimentally confirmed that removing the keystone species in, indeed uh, and alters um, the community composition, so, so really fulfilling the, the definition. So why did it work in this case? Although I just said that in the evaluation, <laughs> the tools performed quite badly. I think it is a very good case. And um, so the pathogen, the pathogen alters the host plant, the host plant in turn then alters the leaf community. So in some cases, we actually, if it's strong like that, in some cases we actually can correctly um, find uh, a hub node and, and also uh, that also turns out to be a, to be a keystone but we should never do that without an experimental validation. You have seen that the tools are quite bad at predicting hub nodes. Here in this case, the signal was so strong that the, the tool picked it up, but I would not rely on it. And in general, whether hub nodes are keystone species, here in this case, it was the case. In general, I think the question is still open and we need um, more validation and more experiments to better know the link between these um, network properties and ecosystem properties. But, uh, maybe not uh, just naively report uh, because the Nova highly connected it is a keystone species. Okay, so um, what do I see as the next steps in microbial network analysis? So one thing that's maybe a bit more trivial, but I think very useful to have is um, automated network annotation. So usually when we build those networks afterward, we look up what each taxon does and we map that onto the node. So is it an early colonizer or late colonizer and the dental plug or is it, uh, does it like uh, lower high pH and so on? And it would be nice to have a tool that does it automatically. And um, we are, um, in my lab, we are currently developing such a tool. So I think this will be useful to have. Then uh, the next point, I made it several times, but I keep repeating, we need a proper benchmark um, data set to, to, to really evaluate network inference tools. So for the moment, we still do not have enough um, fully known interaction networks. So um, yeah, this will be for the future. And also, 
as a last point, a very important point is to find out a bit better how well network properties reflect ecosystem properties. Networks are just a represent representation of ecosystems and not the ecosystem. So how well do their properties reflect what's going on in the ecosystem? And um, I think with this, I'm at the end. I would like a, to just thank all the people with whom I've collaborated and especially Sam, who was really an outstanding PhD student, also acknowledge uh, funding sources. And um, I think with that, we can, we can go uh, to answer questions. And, and thanks a lot for listening. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, both of you. Uh, it was very interesting talk. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, so we do actually have a question already in the Q and A. Um, they're wondering if some network interference methods rely on prior um, prior slash domain knowledge uh, to improve the association prediction, or if that would be feasible. Uh, I can start on this. So domain knowledge in uh, in, the, in terms of known interactions, uh, we have very few um, confirmed interactions. So for games, we do not have that domain knowledge. Otherwise, I think I've seen a tool on it, but I cannot recall its name. So that use, um, yeah, so that, 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 yeah, so that integrates, um, that you can give a list of, of, of known interactions and it will take it into account. I don't know, Sam, if you can add to that or? Uh, so I think there are increasingly people work Working on my, there are some people working on microbial uh, association or interaction databases, but um, there is no established gold standard for this yet, as far as I'm aware. Um, because this data is so inaccessible, it's of course also difficult to develop tools that are really able to take this into account. But I do know of that there are some Bayesian uh, network inference methods which are able to take into account these informative priors. But I'm not sure how well they work with, say, literature uh, validated interactions, which is what the domain knowledge is. Um, would be very interesting to integrate this knowledge if we do have it, though. One addition, so interactions are not static. They can, can quite quickly change because uh, microorganisms can quickly reprogram their metabolism and then do a different cross-fitting interaction than they did before. It's maybe not even a good idea, simply because it will be so ecosystem dependent, so condition dependent. Yeah, just saying. Yeah, I think for obligate symbiotic relationships, it could be really interesting, yeah. but many of the others would indeed be difficult. Uh, just uh, um, a, a follow up on on that one. Um, what would what would be probably the the hardest criteria, or or even if it is just one single point, what do you think would be the hardest one to try and um, help parse out that because as you said it is very ecosystem dependent and it would be any change could be masked would there be any kind of like a fingerprint that you could look for to, to help identify yes of course we can uh, uh this is also an idea that we combine different um types of data so for instance if you have metagenomics data we can look at the genomes we can build metabolic metabolic networks from the genomes and then look at um, metabolic overlap and uh uh, so competition and 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 um, complementarity and we can use that as an additional data set and that's already being done there are some papers on that so that's one way for instance okay all right um <clears throat> so if you could have and this is to, to both of you if you could have you know a wish from a genie for any data set you want what would you choose like what, what would be the perfect data set in your mind Fully resolved interaction network in a real big ecosystem. We don't have that. There was zero hesitation there. You have thought about this, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I said it. Yes, we really like that data. We really like validation data. It is also, I mean, hope and hopefully without higher order interactions, because if we have those, they are extremely hard to infer. And if we have those, then we cannot even use the validation data. <laughs> that makes sense. Sam, what about you? Yeah, I think for me, it's, it's not so much about having one big data set, but really the capacity to generate data sets very quickly, because I think it's extremely limiting right now that we often generate networks, we have hypotheses, but then we want to test those, but testing those, it can easily take years to get the experiment together. So not necessarily one big experiment, but just the ability to generate very small ones very quickly, like, I don't know, some completely autom automated robotic system that just gener does your tiny hypothesis test. That would be perfect. 
Interesting. All right. <laughs> also motivated by that, that this even the robotic system is harder to set up than, than you might think. <laughs> and what you observe in a well plate is uh, maybe not nothing to do with what you observe in the real system. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's also a thing. I, I, yeah, sorry, I just briefly wanted to add. Um, we have some people are working on really cool approaches with uh, laboratory communities, but for me, it's also really interesting to see how we can translate that to real world communities. For example, right now I'm working with soil microbiomes, which are known to have huge species diversity and there's very little known about it. And um, it's very difficult to take actually a lot of the brilliant research that's being done and test that in the real world to see how do we recover that knowledge? So I think for me it would be to to really well, to not just be able to rapidly test our hypothesis, but to be able to test our hypothesis outside the lab, because in the end, you know, we do want to apply our knowledge to things like I don't know climate change or some other big problem. Hmm. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Great. Um, <clears throat> so we do have a follow-up. Uh, they say that um, in response to the, the first question they asked, uh, that yes, that does make sense. Thank you. Um, and then we have uh, a comment. Um, they say, thank you. It's very interesting. Um, they like the scope from the construction of the different analyses, the clustering topology, and comparison. <clears throat> uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a systems guy. I did some, I, I did genomics, but I was very focused on just my one plant and, and that was it. Um, so this might be a, a little naive, but you say um, if you had a, this robotic system I, I, I validating it, um, identifying whether what you're seeing is an accurate thing or whether it's just a, an artifact. Is there is there like a, a smoking gun you look for? Is there anything in particular that would be like, this is obvious that you're valid, this is the, the easiest or, or most direct way to validate that what I'm seeing is translational to a, a real system or something, an artifact of my experiment. So since you're applying uh, the techniques, maybe it's better for you to answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think for me, um, what a smoking gun would be to really disco um, Yeah, this is a difficult question. It's a good question. A smoking gun um, for me is largely that it should be linked to things that we know majorly impact ecosystems. So, um, for example, we know that pH has a huge uh, impact on uh, soils, uh, on soil communities. So a smoking gun would be if we find a network that is generated to pH, whether we would be able to test if certain uh, members of that community are able to modulate that pH in some way. Maybe they can stabilize it or maybe they can adjust it. So it would really be to look for these environmental drivers and try to see if we have species that are in some way able to affect it. But yeah, generally this will depend a lot on the community that you're looking for, I think. And yeah, also on the, the, the type of network that you're analyzing. Yeah, for me smoking gun have some other evidence that yeah, but it's basically what you already said that if, an outside, if it goes together with something we know already about this organisms we know one is a I don't know uh, does nitrogen fixation the other one needs nitrogen nitrogen is compost or it's a primary mm -hmm. fermenter and produces acetate and the other one needs acetate to grow and we know that already yeah but this depends on prior knowledge then of course yeah and that's precisely why domain knowledge is so important I think because of course, um, you know, I did a lot of the tool development, but many microbiomes have very specific and unique interactions uh, or symbiosis, like uh, the example that Caroline showed in the beginning um, with the, the symbiosis between the, the microbial and the microbial, microbial species, but also in insects like the Wolbachia and insect relationships, they can be very interesting. And in that case, it's crucial to know what the community that you're working on looks like, because if you're not familiar with that domain, you're just going to overlook a lot of these smoking to begin with. Gotcha. So it's, it's, it requires a, a specialized understanding from a, a vast array of approaches to, to really get a, a good data set to, to know what fits and what doesn't. All right. Well, a good database reflecting or summarizing this understanding. 